more than ever. And it's particularly pertinent that we meet here to discuss this today, of course, because it's a year on, it's the year anniversary to the date of Occupy Wall Street. Um, many people are starting to believe, rightly or wrongly, that aspects of the free market system do not serve the wider community. That individuals pursuing what Milton Friedman described as their rational self-interest doesn't work. That's why we're seeing wealth taxes widely advocated, new regulations, and a range of new government interventions, which quite often suit the needs of business rather than the need of the wider populace. What tonight we will seek to explore is what we believe are an increasingly problematic aspect of our economic structure, crony capitalism. That's the interactions of big business and government to the detriment of the economic system. And that's why we've suitably invited a range of politicians, businessmen and journalists along to discuss it. One of the big final lectures that Milton Friedman gave to the Cato Institute was on the suicidal impulse of business and how the business community often acted in ways in which they maximised their own short-term self-interest without thinking of the future reaction of their actions, uh, how it's interpreted by the wider public. Often, he said, this is due to the perverse rules and anti-competitive consequences of government action. This raises a key question. How can we develop the rules such that the killer app of capitalism, which is competition, can work its magic? A few weeks ago, we began looking for a comprehensive pro-market explanation of what had gone wrong, something that would look both at the financial sector, but also examine the wider challenges of globalisation and an interconnected world. Something that would make the distinction between being pro-business and pro-market, explaining how often businesses had interacted with governments to the detriment of the wider population, whether it be in tax, regulation, procurement or other government policies. When doing this, a name kept cropping up again and again. Luigi Zingales is the Robert McCormack Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. His research and writings cover a wide range of topics from corporate governance to financial development, from political economy to the economic effects of culture. Recently, he has been involved in developing a blueprint for real-world solutions to the aftermath of the financial crisis, and is the co-developer of the Financial Trust Index, which monitors the level of trust Americans have in their financial system. His book, Saving Capitalism from Capitalists, co-authored with Raghuram Rajan, has been acclaimed as one of the most powerful defences of the free market ever written. His most recent book, uh, this book, A Capitalism for the People, Recapturing the Lost Genius of American Prosperity, came out in June 2012 and led to him being described as a crusader against crony capitalism. The National Review said, A Capitalism for the People is the book that hits closest to the mark on the question of where the American centre-right ought to go in the next few years. Given that the aims of this institution are to defend the principles of liberty, competition and economic freedom, we are deeply honoured that Professor Zingales has agreed to speak here this evening, and we're looking forward to you outlining the central thesis of your book before opening out into a general discussion with all of us. Thank you. So you want me to... Oh, no. No, no, it's not. Nice. Okay, so that, that's very simple. So, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. I think that the central thesis is, is very simple. Uh, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, um, Fukuyama said that uh, this is the end of history. Capitalism has triumphed and uh, there is no sort of uh, tension, there is no doubt. Uh, and the last uh, 20 years, the following 20 years, have been quite good for free markets in general. However, this intellectual uh, hegemony has brought I think uh, both complacency and extremism. Uh, complacency because uh, there was no debate about what was wrong with the system, and extremism because we all believe that sort of a uh, pursuit of self-interest is, is good, but uh, uh, I don't think it's right to think that uh, greed is good and uh, the boundless pursuit of self-interest is always the thing to advocate. And uh, the crisis hit sort of uh, this equilibrium uh, as a, it's a big shock. And unfortunately, the reaction to the crisis have been uh, too extreme and, and both sort of, uh, in my view, wrong. On the one hand, you had sort of uh, the left that saw the crisis as a evidence that uh, capitalism is fatally flawed. 
And uh, the reaction was to try to propose some of the same recipes. It was like more government intervention, more regulation, everything that they sort of were forced to keep uh, silent for 20 years, they sort of uh, brought back with vengeance. On the other hand, there was sort of uh, the intellectual uh, uh, center-right uh, said, oh, this is sort of all due to uh, bad government intervention, and particularly in the United States, this was blamed on uh, Fannie and Freddie. Uh, and uh, so uh, if we get rid of that, those, which I'm not sure we will ever be able to get rid of those, but if we get rid of those, then the system will be fine and uh, we don't have to worry. And I think that uh, both positions are, are wrong. I think that uh, the, uh, the free market system is the best system. However, uh, what we are concerned, we should be concerned, is about the excessive uh, political power that business has, and in particular, large business. Uh, political power that is not used to enhance markets, but to sort of uh, enhance the profits of uh, individual companies at the expense of everybody else. And since the ultimate public good are uh, the good framework in which markets operate, and while sort of uh, capitalists have an interest in, in lobbying and defending their own sort of uh, side of the equation, they are not, nobody has an interest in uh, promote, promoting free markets uh, as they are. And what is particularly worrisome, and what in a sense my book is about, is uh, the danger that um, this situation is bringing, uh, also from a political point of view. We, we uh, saw not only Occupy Wall Street, but the indignados in Spain, and even more so, there is a mayor in southern Spain that is now really running a very populist approach where they expropriate uh, uh, food in the supermarkets because uh, this is... Uh, protecting the interest of uh, the people at large. And this populism is, is, is very dangerous. And my experience in Italy, and I think that the, the same evidence is true in the United States, I would like to hear your opinion in the United Kingdom, but is that there is a very dangerous spiral that starts with populists puts sort of uh, the property rights in doubt and creates an environment which is not really very conducive to uh, good business. As a result, business says, I'm not going to be able to operate unless I have some form of uh, support and subsidy from the government. And so the government feels compelled, even sort of, uh, some people honestly think the only way to get sort of uh, business to start and work is to grant them some special privileges because without the special privileges, they will never invest because they are afraid of this populist uh, movement. And uh, the problem is that those very privileges that they are giving uh, do nothing but fuel more populists down the road. And so it is a vicious sp spiral that I've seen playing in Italy over and over again. And unfortunately, I've seen starting also in the United States. In, in 2009, basically at the very time in which Congress voted a 100% tax on bank bonuses. Uh, the tax never became low because the Senate did not vote, but still, the majority of Congress voted for such a crazy thing as 100% tax on bank bonuses. At the very time, uh, the Obama administration, and Guyton in particular, created this uh, private uh, public investment partnership that was basically a gigantic subsidy to uh, the financial sector to invest in toxic assets where they were taking all the upside and the government was taking all the downside. It's a, uh, the old rule, uh, had I win, tell you lose. And uh, that's sort of uh, what has been so successful in the financial industry and what they keep repeating. But the problem is that they, the Obama administration felt justified that we need to give these subsidies because they are so afraid of expropriation down the line that if we don't subsidize them, they, they will not invest. And of course, those vain subsidies created even more resentment and sort of things uh, uh, spiral in that way. So the, the goal of, this, uh, of my book is to do something quite uh, challenging, i.e. to try to capture uh, this resentment, this sort of revolt that we, we feel in the United States but across the world, and use it for a good purpose rather than a bad purpose. So uh, my 
hope. And uh, I think at this point is a hope, but I, hopefully in the future will become sort of a, uh, something uh, practical. My hope is to be able to channel uh, this resentment in the, against the crony part of capitalism and not against the capitalist part of capitalism. And uh, I think that un unless we explain to people what the real problem is, they cannot understand. And so um, we're discussing earlier about the, the US political situation. What is interesting is that the political debate until the election has been dominated by the two extreme movements, the, the Tea Party movement and the Occupy movement. And my claim is, paradoxically, these movements have a lot in common. The Tea Party is actually fighting uh, big government. The Occupy Wall Street is fighting big business. However, what people don't realize is these two Leviathans are basically two faces of the same monster because the real problem is big business in bed with big government. That's really the ultimate sort of a problem. And until people realize that this is a common enemy, they're going to fight the wrong battle. And so after a year of this battle, what we have are two presidential candidates that they both converge toward the center where they are trying to get all possible sort of a fundraising possible from big business, and they don't really represent an alternative. And in fact, my claim, I, I'm a bit cynical, coming from the land of Machiavelli, but <laughs> it's sort of a, my view is that a lot of the discussion about uh, gay rights or sort of uh, abortion and all those things are just side steps to create a difference between two parties that in their establishment have no big difference. Because at the end of the day, the establishment of both parties is really aggressive trying to fundraise from businesses and get sort of a subsidy from businesses. And I think that that's the real problem we need to, to face. And so uh, what my book is about is, number one, sort of uh, explaining why this is such a big problem in the United States, and I think sort of uh, it's becoming increasingly all over the world, and then trying to uh, to propose solution, and uh, I don't want to take too much time for the question and answers. I'm happy to discuss any of the proposed solution, but I have to admit from upfront, I, I don't think I have the killer app to fix all the problems. I wish I had, I don't. Uh, however, I think that the killer app ultimately is understanding where the problem comes from. Uh, and I think the problem comes from a lack of recognition that being pro-market does not necessarily mean being pro-business. Very often the two ideas coincide. Uh, you know, good businessmen want to want free market when they enter into a market. The moment they are in, they want to put buyers to entry uh, and make more profit, which is healthy and natural as long as they don't do it with the help of the government. And I think that uh, our role is to have a government that uh, operates as, as pro-market and not necessarily pro-business. And I, this is sort of a, an uphill battle, I know, but people ask me, what hope do you have? And my example is, think about the battle against uh, secondhand smoking. Uh, 20 years ago uh, was a hopeless battle, and it was a battle against a sort of a group that had everything, had sort of money, uh, knowledge, contacts, lobbying power, uh, we're not afraid to sort of uh, uh, cajole and sponsor all research proving that this was wrong, etc. In 20 years, at least in the United States, as far as I know, in the United Kingdom, in most of the Western world, uh, the power of, uh, of the smoking industry has been really contained and uh, we've made gigantic progress toward the, the right solution. So even if it is, it seems like a hopeless battle, I think it's not. It's a hopeless battle if we think to change things this election or next year. If our horizon is 20 years, I think it's not a hopeless battle. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Um, I'm going to kick off by asking a question that sort of came to mind when I was reading the book. Um, increasingly, with the interconnectedness of the world and development of the internet and apps and things like that. You're right and you describe in the book that the competition really comes in the design as opposed to the, the delivery of the product. So there's an example in the book which says 
you know, everybody might be trying to design an app that does a particular thing, but once there's a reputational effect that one app is the best app, it's captured the whole market. And you might see something similar with Google being the best search engine. My question then is, how do you regulate big business or how do you oversee big business when these entities are global entities as opposed to just operating in the UK? How do you go about tackling that political power when it crosses um, national boundaries? I think that that's definitely a, a very tough uh, uh, problem. There is, however, uh, some hope in the sense, uh, I think that part of what of the reason why the United States over the years did relatively well in this dimension is precisely because they were originally too big to be conquered by one industry and two, and there was competition across states against sort of uh, uh, think about tobacco. Um, in Kentucky, the tobacco industry votes, and so when uh, one guy actually from BAT, British and uh, 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 wanted to leak some crucial information. He was under an order not to speak by the local judges that, of course, were sort of uh, captured by the tobacco industry. And what made uh, the, this information come out was the fact that in Mississippi, it's not the most progressive state of the nation, uh, <laughs> but they don't produce tobacco. So the tobacco industry has no power there, and the judge there uh, sort of uh, had an interest in suing the tobacco industry because they wanted to get some money. And the result was that this information came out and changed the world. So in a sense, we are facing this issue because I think that uh, uh, in economics, we sort of always distinguish between uh, getting big because you are the most efficient and exploiting your bigness to do something else. And while the first is perfectly fine, is the second which is problematic. And uh, now, the, the very difficult frontier is that a lot of uh, uh, the, the, isn't the thing that determines profitability is not so much of old-fashioned regulation, but is shaping of property rights. What can you do with the data you collect? Google has a freedom in America that no producer in the Europe has. And so, uh, there is a, we, we, it's not only because the Silicon Valley is so progressive, blah, 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 but if you had tried to do the same in Paris or London, you could not have operated. Uh, so, Google is trying to force its view of the world to the rest of, of, uh, of the world, and uh, I think that uh, in part, sort of uh, uh, Europe is fighting back, not for noble principles of free markets, but simply because Google is American. Uh, in the same way in which uh, my current Prime Minister and previous uh, uh, European Commissioner um, was very tough in enforcing antitrust, just by accident only against American companies. Uh, there was never a case brought against the European company. Uh, so I think that there are clearly sort of uh, problems of uh, uh, this regulatory framework because uh, companies are better at organizing than sort of regulators. Uh, but there is also a, a positive aspect that uh, there is not complete capture and sort of some competition helps in that dimension. However, I think it is a, a real challenge we need to, to think about and try to, to sort of uh, um, do something about it. Uh, now, lots of your work has been looking at the uh, financial sector, the financial system, and I know that Ian, you're currently um, writing a book on the financial <coughs> crisis. Yeah. Um, I wondered whether you had any comments. If not, I've got a question on the financial crisis. But, uh, well, first I want to say it's an absolutely brilliant book. It's my, my book of the summer. And on the way here, someone said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to meet the author of this extraordinary um, work, which is Rooseveltian in its... Uh, in its scope and its imagination, and he said FDR. And I said no, 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 Teddy Roosevelt, the, the, <laughs> wrong, the wrong Roosevelt. But I was, I was going to ask, why is it that this crisis, as well as producing a false narrative <coughs> explanation, which is believed by hundreds of millions of people about why it happened, why hasn't it produced a Teddy Roosevelt figure? That, that's a, a, an excellent question, and uh, I think that uh, 
there is kind of a lack of, uh, if you want, ideology. Today at lunch there was uh, this thing about the power of ideology. I think that uh, in a sense that's exactly what is lacking. And uh, when I started by saying sort of uh, free marketeers have become complacent and extremist, is they are trying to protect everything that is business saying if you are criticizing you are an anti-business socialist and uh, they've been very successful in doing that so uh, not only sort of uh, people from the center but even people from the left today are afraid to criticize big business and in a sense I felt upon myself to trying to fix this because I said uh, there, there is hardly anybody with better credential than me, uh, in the sense that not because I'm so great, etc. But I, I am actually one of the few Italian economists that have always, always been free market, even in Italy. Uh, I sort of uh, was uh, uh, supporting free market when. Uh, there were communists in my school trying to sort of hit me because I was a free market. Uh, so, and, and I teach at the University of Chicago that, uh, for better or worse, is the symbol of the free market. So it's very hard to um, box it into sort of a, a socialist uh, thing. And, uh, uh, and I think it's important that somebody like me stands out and say, look, the problem is not free market, the problem is Part of business and part of a sort of a, I don't claim I have any uh, huge insight. I think that unfortunately I've learned the uh, sort of old-fashioned way. And uh, part of the inspiration from this book uh, was when I sort of in the middle of the crisis start reading uh, *Road to Serfdom* uh, by Hayek. And in the introduction, it says sometimes moving around the world, you end up seeing the same movie over and over again. And uh, that gives you an advantage, even if uh, he was very modest, because even if you don't have a particular sort of insight, but you see, um, and I felt the same way. And when I saw the United States going into crazy interventionism without any sort of uh, uh, guidelines, today at lunch, John was saying, you know, you need to intervene when you think there is a market failure. You need first to prove the market failure, and then try to intervene in a way that minimizes the extent of the intervention and target it to the market failure you have identified. Uh, this discipline, all of a sudden, was lost. In the United States, even people like uh, Martin Fetchstein, that had always been sort of a very traditional uh, conservative guys, or, or Glenn Hubbard, who advises uh, now Mitt Romney, they proposed all sort of crazy intervention uh, without any guideline. And they say, you know, we need some ideology back here to say what is right and wrong and uh, what is useful for the market, what is just useful for business. Uh, we need people to stand up and say that. And, and uh, for me, it was particularly natural because I've seen the devastation that uh, my former prime minister brought to my country, uh, somebody that uh, really stole the flag of free markets and uh, use it in the most devastating way and uh, diluting a, a, a lot of people because a lot of people follow just because they follow the flag and this has devastating effect on the economy of the country but also on the ideology of the country because some ideas become sort of full out of words as a result and I think that uh, it's very important to prevent this from happening and the best way, my way, my, my view is to stand up and criticize what needs to be criticized, but endorse what needs to be endorsed. But in political terms, is that because, is the, is the failure rooted in the determination of the political class, loosely left and right, the major parties, to cluster around the center? And are they doing that, and they're certainly doing that in America to raise money, as you suggested, but also because that, but it strikes me that that model of, of pursuing politics, which um, Clinton, Clinton is so brilliant at, Blair copies, clustering around the centre, being nice to business, and which voters need to hear that. Voters need to hear that you're in favour of being nice to business because the voter is taught to hear, to equate that with the country making money. So you get this sort of cluster in the centre, which we've had now for 20, 25 years. 
and that's gone bust. Mm. That's gone. That's gone. That kind of politics has gone. Has I would argue has gone bust. Uh, but nothing has yet replaced it. Which it's just odd that something as yeah. as important as an American election can happen without it. It didn't even produce one credible challenger for the Republican nomination. It's not even as though there was one alternative to Romney who embodied, who, who was interested in these arguments and expressed them. I think you said the magic word, credible. And uh, let me share sort of another thought. One other reason that pushed me to write this book is that I wrote, merely after the crisis, a, a piece called Capitalist, Capitalist After the Crisis that appeared on national affairs. And uh, to my surprise, it was widely quoted and endorsed by Sarah Powell. And all of a sudden, I got phone calls from journalists assuming I was the sort of uh, uh, economic <laughs> advisor of Sao Paulo. And that scared the hell out of me, yes. <laughs> Not to mention from my wife, she was even more scared. <laughs> then, then I sat down a second and I said, why this is the case? I said, it was clear that it was not coming from her. Some advisors told her to do that because the funny thing is that this book, that's called American by Heart, uh, were quoted like Milton Friedman, Adam Smith, and Luigi Zingales. This was well, not like a, a, a fair game. There was something strange. And then I, I thought, I said, you know, the person who advised this was very smart. Because if Sarah Palin had run, the natural platform she could have run, unfortunately, was my platform. Because she was hated by the establishment anyway. So it was not difficult for her to sort of uh, stay away. Uh, she had sort of a uh, wide recognition so that she could actually raise money without the establishment. Uh, and she needed something different to stand. And I sort of got this nightmare that my sort of political agenda was represented by Sarah Pollan. Um, but, but this tells you something is it takes sort of a desperate guy uh, like Sarah Pollan is and was to some extent to take that agenda. Why? Because if you fail, uh, you don't have a job as a lobbyist, you don't have sort of a contract with uh, Fox News and so on and so forth. Now, what is interesting is that nobody from Fox News touched me. I went out sort of uh, promoting this book and, you know, the day Sarah Palin quoted me, I had like a, a, a long line of uh, uh, people willing to interview me, and uh, I honestly said, look, I, I don't care about Sarah Palin, I think that, uh, uh, but uh, the moment I came out with this book, nobody from Fox News touched me. Uh, and I think that's indicative. Uh, it is a position that an academic who has nothing to lose can take, uh, but if you are running for office, you're planning to have your life organized on this, it's a very dangerous position to take. In, in, in my view, there is a reason why you have a lot of crazy people who are populist. Because, in a sense, it doesn't give you a good career. Only a crazy guy would pick it up as a, as a flag. Uh, only a desperate guy is kind of uh, against all odds. Uh, but that's very dangerous because then the guys who succeed, because there is a big market. I think your question, if I can reinterpret, is a very sort of a legitimate question. Says there is a huge market share there. There is an opportunity for every entrepreneur. Why they're not taking it? And the answer is because if you fail, you're burned for life. So uh, until it's well established, nobody wants to take it. And the fear is the person who is taking it is a crazy guy. And this is what's happening in Italy. We have a, a comedian, actually a professional comedian, because. All the other politicians are comedian, but <laughs> this one is a professional comedian who is running on a, on a populist platform, and some polls give him like 20, 25 percent of the vote. And this guy sort of uh, cannot speak for more than 30 seconds without using swear words and stupid things. Uh, nevertheless, is they sort of uh, popular? Why? Because uh, there is a market there, and the question is how to take that market in a credible way. So that is what I'm trying to do with my book. I, I try to open 
the avenue for a Roosevelt, you know Roosevelt, not for a Sarah Powell. <laughs> uh, David Ruffley, a member of the Treasury Select Committee. Yes. Luigi, good to see you again. Um, good to see you. As a practicing politician, I'm very keen on policy mm -hmm. descriptions. Could you say a little more, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's in the American context of big business or uh, EU, um, whether those would be uh, tax interventions mm -hmm. uh, and examples of public subsidies that you think politicians should be looking at if mm -hmm. they want to move towards your agenda? I think the, in, in the US is very simple. I think that uh, from a, for example, a tax point of view, you want to eliminate every uh, deduction and tax favoritism. I think that uh, uh, oh, uh, Romney has mentioned that, but he's never sort of come down to explain which one. And, uh, and I think that it's basically impossible, in my view, to pick and choose. Once you start saying that some are allowed, uh, it's a slippery slope and 2,000 more come down the line. So the only defensible line is zero. And not is because there are no good causes, it's because the objective here is to make it more difficult and to reduce the return to lobby. If, if we start to open the door that with a good story, you can get a subsidy, you know how many people can tell good stories? Uh, I know a few, and, uh, and you have the line. And so the answer is, uh, I'm sorry, we should sort of get rid of this. Um, another proposal that I made and, and fell really on deaf ears, especially the Republican Party, is to say, uh, we know that corporate taxation in the, U in the US is too high. Um, we also know that people are complaining, rightly or wrongly, that some people pay only the 15% uh, tax rate. And then if you uh, are lucky enough to sort of only live off dividends in this moment in the United States, you pay a 15% tax rate. And uh, now, you pay a 15% tax rate on your income tax, uh, people forget that you already pay 35% at the corporate level. So I said, why don't we do the simplest thing? We swap the rates. Today we have a 35% corporate tax rate in the States and a 15% tax rate on capital gains and dividends. Suppose you move and you have a 15% tax rate on corporation and a 35% tax rate on that income at the personal level. Now, the overall tax burden does not change. What it does change are two things. Number one is you are decreasing the burden on corporations, making number more competitive, but most importantly, reducing their incentive to find loopholes. Because corporations are much more successful than individuals in lobbying for loopholes and, and, and uh, sort of uh, lower tax rates. So it is true that allegedly, the corporate tax rate 35%. It's also true that if you look at uh, Google, or you look at uh, Microsoft, you look at all these corporations, the effective tax rate is much, much lower. And so this is ultimately the most unfair of all the taxes because if you have a small corporation uh, that you need to grow, etc., you do pay your full 35%. But if you are a large corporation, you pay much less. So that's the most regressive tax of all. Second, uh, in this way, you make Mitt Romney tax return much more palatable because he's going to pay 35% tax rate and at the end of the day he's not paying any more or less dime than he's paying today uh, but in a way that is perceived as more fair by most people. So I think that uh, that would be the perfect solution if on top of that you also eliminate the deductibility of uh, uh, interest uh, costs on corporate taxes you can bring the tax rate on corporation to 10% and sort of uh, achieve all what you want to achieve. So uh, I think that these reforms are so simple that it's almost like uh, silly that somebody is here to propose them. But so why, if they are so simple, don't get much endorsement? It's of course because there are a lot of uh, interests that say, no, we want to stop that. So much of my um, proposals are in the spirit of saying, let's be simple. Let's get rid of uh, the problem is not uh, uh, there's too little regulation. The problem is that there is too much ineffective regulation. Uh, I, we don't want zero regulation because that would be the jungle. That's not a free market. 
uh, we want uh, the minimum amount of effective regulation and the only way to achieve it is to make regulation very simple so that uh, with all due respect you know in the United States Congress are not much less sophisticated than the UK but my line is that so simple that even congressmen can understand <laughs> and, and you know in, this is not only a joke because when Nancy Pelosi passed the FK reform she said we need to pass it to understand what's in it <laughs> and that's really scary because what you would like to do is exactly the other way around and, and uh, so I think that simplicity makes sort of uh, um, the popular pressure much more effective uh, and another way in which you can achieve simplicity is reducing regulation very often to some targeted taxation so Mayor Bloomberg trying to introduce complicated regulation to reduce the consumption of solar pumps and that's exactly what you don't want to do if you really think that solar pumps create like an extra 90 because our children are too fat and uh, this will cost uh, health care a lot of money uh, the only effective way to do it is just to put a tax on the sugar content in solar pumps uh, this is something that can be debated in Congress, or can be debated by the public at large, we decide whether this is good or bad. Anybody can sort of chip in with their own opinion. Uh, if we decide that is not the right thing, let's get rid of all the other regulation. The other regulation only feeds sort of uh, the lobbyists and the lawyers that design it. Doesn't serve any useful purpose. So uh, the more you reduce regulation to some simple targeted tax, which in honor of uh, uh, Cecile Pigou, it's called Piguvian taxes, uh, the, the, the better it is. And uh, my view is actually trying, precisely because taxes are unattractive, people don't want to sort of campaign on this, my goal is to turn everything, every economic policy into a tax. Why? Precisely because they are unattractive. So think about subsidy to home ownership. Uh, they, they, are, they were so devastating in the United States because they are so appealing. The more appealing an idea is, the more devastating it is when it's in the hands of people that are trying to get money out of the government. Uh, however, as economists, we know that if the goal is really to change the incentives of the margin, you can do it with a subsidy, you can do it with taxes. Taxes are a much less appealing way to do it than with subsidies. So if I were to go to Congress and say, I want to increase home ownership in America, and as a result, I'm going to tax renters. I don't think I'm going to be re-elected next time. <laughs> uh, however, if that's my only way to do it, uh, then uh, in some sort of a direction, I will do it. And so if my only way to uh, reduce pollution is to put a nice tax on CO2 emissions, I have the choice either to do nothing or to put a tax. I think a lot of people would vote in favor of a tax. Can I interrupt? Well, please, please. I, just don't, I don't understand your tobacco example then, because surely that has been the approach to tobacco to taxes, except for it's now changed now, and ta tobacco is now becoming prohibited, mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very curious about your example earlier on about using the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And now your argument for simplifying things, which I have a lot of sympathy with, uh, on taxation, because up to a point, effectively, that is exactly what we did with something like tobacco. Yes. We didn't take a moral judgment, well, we did take a moral judgment on it, but we taxed it. But actually, you seem to be rather pleased earlier on that it's effectively become prohibited by, because um, uh, uh, very different forms of regulation have hit in now on tobacco. You, you can't advertise it. The free market's disappearing no, in tobacco. It, it is true that tobacco is not just taxation, it was also regulation, but I think that the taxation was a pretty effective way to keep it down, and uh, uh, also a way that raised revenues so that we can reduce other taxes that are distortionary, like income taxes. So, uh, I don't know why, sort of, uh, in general, sort of, uh, uh, for, especially for conservatives, taxes are, it's a four letter no, organization. That's not that's but, right. but, but, but I think that uh, targeted taxes in this dimension can be, number one, a good substitute for regulation. 
Number two could be a good substitute, substitute to other taxation that's more distortionary. So, but should, should, should t tax regulation be tax adequate for tobacco? Given the way you used um, British and American tobacco as an example earlier on, <laughs> it seemed to me you weren't saying that tax was an adequate method. You were pleased that the, that particular industry had been hit finally. No, I think I was pleased that the information came out. I think that what, what is uh, what I thought. I, honestly, I, when when I grew up, I was uh, cynical, but not so cynical as I'm now. And I would never in my life have expected that uh, companies were on purpose manipulating cigarettes to make it more addictive. I think that uh, uh, that that's a pretty horrendous thing to do, uh, and this was kept sort of uh, uh, hidden from sort of uh, uh, the, the American public or the world public at large. And if it wasn't for litigation and all these things, it would never have come out. So uh, this coming out was useful as a way to uh, reduce the power of the tobacco industry and also make some taxes much more appealing. This is, if you didn't have that support, they would have fought back very aggressively. You know that most uh, uh, tobacco companies uh, where big donors of museums uh, and charities, etc., and they were doing on purpose to create a consensus to prevent sort of uh, uh, additional uh, taxes on the tobacco industry. So I think that uh, uh, the, the reason why, because all this idea came from a reflection, say, from an economist point of view, point of view Pigouvian taxes are the only way of taxes we'd like to add. Uh, this is the ultimate sort of a form of taxation. However, if you look around the world, they're extremely rare. Uh, in the United States, as an example, you have gigantic regulation with the consumption uh, um, limit for cars and all the stuff, but you don't have a tax on gasoline, which will be the most natural way to deal with it. So, so why, why is that the case? And the answer is because the political economy of Peruvian taxation is exactly the opposite of the uh, subsidy political economy. In, in a subsidy, there are few people who benefit and a lot of people who are taxed. In a peculiar taxation, there are few people who are taxed and a lot of people that benefit. So that's the reason why I say, okay, why don't we invert the paradigm and say that you cannot give subsidies, but that doesn't we limit your ability to do political economy, you can, or economic policy, you can do economic policy as long as you stick to taxes. So now you have the choice, uh, either you tax or you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we're going to see a bit more of uh, uh, Peruvian taxes. Well, we have both, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I haven't yet read your book, but I'm um, looking forward to it, especially as a number of elements of it seem to chime in with um, to, um, to lectures I've heard from the Von Mises Institute people on sort of the economic history of regulation, to, um, sort of looking at how producers capture the political process in, in, in very large part. And that raises questions in my mind about how you're proposing as a solution to move to a, a taxation rather than a sort of subsidy approach, because you actually need the political class and who have been captured to go down that route. And I don't quite see that, I haven't read your, your arguments yet, but I don't quite see that from, from what you're saying tonight. No, so I think there's an issue about how you get them to, to, to embrace that sort of approach. Absolutely. This is a very important problem I tried to deal with in, in the book. Uh, and the way it was described very cleverly by John Plander in his review in the Financial Times was, it, it requires sort of turkeys to vote for Christmas. Um, and, and I think that's a difficult thing to do. However, uh, there is a bit of a hope. This is if you plan to have uh, a early Thanksgiving, voting for Christmas sounds like a very good idea. And so uh, uh, this metaphor is suggesting that the way we should get people to go against their interests is by making very clear that if you don't go that way, you're not re-elected. And uh, when I was saying you have to...